I want to welcome you uh, to the workshop that's hosted by our food and nutrition section of the Illinois Public Health Association. Um, today's gathering is a result of many people's commitment of time, thought, and care. So I'd like to thank them right now. Ty Hayes and Simon Swartzman uh, provided invaluable assistance with every aspect of today's event. Noel Chavez, Denise Boyd, and Bettina Tassin, uh, who will be joining me for uh, upcom the upcoming year as office holders for the food and nutrition section, helped conceptualize and guide the process. Cheryl Galagos has provided leadership for many years to the section. Yuka Asada, Jim Brown, Kevin Lindley, and Meredith Kahn have provided important time discussing policy as well as documenting comments in the public forum that Valerie mentioned. And then also today we have some help from Robin Rice, uh, Anna Petke, and a number of others. I really thank everybody. Uh, the staff of IPHA, Jody Dart, Chrissy Roseberry, and uh, Jim Nelson, of course, uh, have uh, stayed on top of uh, numerous details and uh, with support from the IPHA Executive Council. A special thanks to my friend and coworker, Valerie Webb, for important advice and for her leadership in the Illinois Public Health Association over the last couple of years. I'd like to recognize our panelists as well, who are here to help us learn, to think critically, and to give us an honest presentation of their insights into a complex and often charged topic um, an extremely important topic that uh, addresses a core human need. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, John W. Boyd Jr. is not here with us today. I share your disappointment. Uh, it's a loss. Um, uh, I think he would have had and does have a lot of very important uh, experiences uh, to relate. Um, I can only say um, that um, we only heard from his assistant, uh, Shannon Chapman, uh, less than three hours ago uh, over the phone. Uh, she said that um, he was not able to attend. Um, uh, it's not clear to us what the circumstances are, um, so I really don't want to speculate. Um, my understanding is that you know, he, he's okay. Um, however, it is a loss. Um, I'm sorry, but we uh, have a wonderful panel. Uh, and the topic is very important. So, you know, we're going to model uh, flexibility and, um, and, and the commitment and desire. <laughs> One of the most important and tragic disasters in, the more recent, in, in more recent history is the flooding of New Orleans in 2005. The inequities of race and class in America were laid bare for all to see. A recent article published in the American Journal of Public Health made, it, made an important connection, in my mind, between the need for equity and sustainable food systems as the foundation for prepared communities. The article measured access to supermarkets in New Orleans at three points in time, before Hurricane Katrina, and then shortly afterwards in 2007, and finally again in 2009. Donald Rose and colleagues compared the number of supermarkets in predominantly African-American neighborhoods to other neighborhoods. The main finding is that residents of African-American neighborhoods had 40% less likelihood to have an additional supermarket in their neighborhood. This is before Katrina. Then the disparity got worse. In 2007, African-Americans were 71% less likely than other city residents to have access to an additional supermarket. Then finally, in 2009, the disparity returned to pre-Katrina levels. In other words, there was an unequal access to supermarkets in New Orleans by race, then it got worse, and then it returned to the same level of inequality that existed before the flood. I suggest that the implications of this study for preparedness are important to consider. If our organizations and institutions are not able to provide equitable access to one of the most basic of human needs, it is prudent to assume that other important resources are also inequitably distributed along racial and ethnic lines. If the distribution in New Orleans of resources such as water, emergency food supplies, medicine, planning, shelters, evacuation infrastructure, and leadership is characterized by the same inequity as supermarkets, 
Is it implausible to consider the likelihood of another disaster response that took such a disproportionate high toll on, the, on black lives? On the other hand, from a sustainable food system perspective, eliminating food deserts also provides the opportunity to create local wealth, employment opportunities for adults and youth, and neighborhood and institutional organization that can increase resiliency in the face of disasters. This is being done in Buffalo, where the Massachusetts Avenue Project has trained more than 350 young people in gardening, food systems, and business while using vacant lots to grow and sell more than 5,000 pounds of affordable fresh produce to residents in the community. MAP packages its own chili starter and salsa sold in grocery stores throughout the region. The region. A new aquaponics facility will yield 25,000 tilapia fish in the coming year. And um, in our metropolitan Chicago region and in Illinois as a state, we have a number of similar projects that have the know-how and the experience and the, uh, the, ability, the uh, ability to show uh, that they can uh, do similar uh, kinds of activities. Um, what I'm showing on the screen is a picture of a youth who just came off of a, a Fresh Moves mobile bus who is raising high a fresh apple before he goes back to the uh, playing basketball in North Lawndale in Chicago, where there's low access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, this Fresh uh, Moves Mobile uh, produce store hires local residents um, and partners with many organizations, including the Green Youth Farm of the Chicago Botanic Garden. And uh, right on the right-hand side of that screen, you can see the, uh, the, deck, the, uh, uh, the bus in the background. So let me briefly describe what a food system is, and I'd like to recognize the work of several authors that I use here and quote extensively, including David Walinga, Michael Hamm, Mary Story, and others from a special 2009 free issue of the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition. So as I quote from these authors, a systems approach recognizes the existence of a complex interaction of processes with outcomes and results that influence those same processes. There is not just one factor that makes for optimal function or dysfunction of the whole. A much broader and deeper understanding of health derives from looking at the food system as an entire system, from consumers back to food processors and farmers, and not only at the food itself, but at the health implications of how that food is produced, processed, marketed, and distributed. In addition, the food system is a nature-based system. Food and agriculture are inexorably rooted in natural cycles. David Walinga challenges public health workers to understand this. Otherwise, we run the risk of one policy negating another policy's effectiveness. For instance, community incentives for more fruits and vegetables in convenience stores could be overwhelmed by federal policies that create a favorable business environment for the production of highly processed foods. So some of the problems, there are many, many problems. I don't have time to go through every, every one of them. I'll list some of them. Hunger in Illinois. 11.1% of Illinois households face food insecurity. Almost 2 million Illinois children are eligible to receive free and reduced lunch. 1.6 million people participated in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, in February 2010, which is a 14% increase in the number of households participating from the previous year. Food deserts exist throughout our state of Illinois, and the United States Department of Agriculture has created a new online uh, food desert calculator, which you can find um, if you put in USDA food map in Google, it'll come up, um, as well as um, studies including those by Daniel Block, Noel Chavez, and Bergen, who show food deserts existing disproportionately in low-income communities of color throughout uh, metropolitan Chicago area. In addition, there's a high cost of the recommended fruits and vegetables. 
Uh, between the time, uh, time period of 1985 to 2000, uh, fresh fruits and vegetable prices increased by almost 40%, whereas carbonated soft drink prices decreased over that time period by 20, almost 24%. We all know about uh, the obesity epidemic leading to high and disproportionate rates of diabetes and other chronic illnesses that are related to diet. We also have struggles to provide healthy foods to students in school. In addition, farmers struggle to make a living. Uh, over the period of 1929 to 2004, um, the net farm income barely uh, made or was a bit below the uh, cost of production. So farmers are struggling. Um, in addition, another problem is a report of, called The Color of Food, which indicates that there are 11 million people working in the food chain full-time, earning an income, and that women and people of color earn anywhere from 50 to 23% less than white men working in this food chain. For the entire nation to meet the dietary guidelines recommendations, uh, of, of intake of fresh fruits and vegetables with domestically produced fruits and vegetables, the acreage devoted to pr growing that produce would need to be increased by approximately 13 million acres. In 2003, more than twice as many fresh vegetables were imported as were exported. A good graphic representation of a disconnect between public health goals and agriculture policy is created by an organization called Kitchen Gardeners International, KGI.org, I think. They show the layout of the White House Garden in spring of 2011. That layout of the White House Garden is planted with a wide range of vegetables, spinach, lettuce, bok choy, turnips, blueberries, collards, beets, peas, kale, radish, rhubarb, kohlrabi, herbs, mint, raspberries, Swiss chard, arugula, and broccoli. The comparison garden is called America's subsidy garden. In this garden, four commodity crops get 90% of the $11 billion per year subsidy. Corn, wheat, cotton, and soybeans. Fruits and vegetables receive one half of 1% of the total subsidy equal to $50 million per year. It is a tiny part of the garden in terms of square feet on this layout. The American industrial food system consumes fossil fuels intensively, accounting for about 19% of the nation's fossil energy. Industrialized food production greatly impacts climate, and a change in climate will in turn greatly impact food production. Climate change will change weather patterns and increase extreme weather, and the resultant increases in heat, drought, and downpours will have significant regional impacts on farming. And um, a study by uh, professors from Stanford have showed that there already is an um, impact on uh, food and these crops. Weather, grown dur weather during the growing season is changing in many but not all of the places where crops are grown. These changes are big enough to have significant effects on crop production in many of the world's regions. Um, and so this is something that is, a, is of concern. Industrialized animal production is, in, is intensive in its use of antibiotics in addition to other resources. As much as 70% of all antimicrobials in the United States are given to otherwise healthy beef cattle, swine, and poultry in their feed as a part of the uh, routine production. Half of these antibiotics are thought to be from seven drug classes important to human medicine, including penicillin, tetracyclines, and erythromycins. 